on giants. Mounds, monsters, myth and man, or Why We Want to Be Small, by Brad Lockwood. Copyright 2010, Brad Lockwood, all rights reserved. Doubting Thomas and the Mormons. We have been here before. Adam was 123 feet 9 inches and Eve 118 feet 9 inches. These measurements were calculated by Matthew Henrian, a baron, French magistrate, historian, and journalist of the 19th century, based on giant bones being unearthed in Europe and America that were perplexing, startling, and inspiring the world. Evidently, we are descended from giants. Native lore and actual finds have continually bolstered the belief in our earlier, larger ancestors. Many believe that Homer may have used the hollow skull of an unearthed mammoth, the cartilage decomposed and only a single gaping hole remaining, appearing like a large eye in the center of a giant skull, as the basis for Cyclops in the Odyssey, dated to 850 BC. More recently, seers and clerics have used scientific evidence to endorse the Bible, especially stories of the flood and lost tribes. Hung from churches and other public places, such, quote, bones of the giants mentioned in scripture, end quote, have appeared throughout Europe in multiple eras. Giraud, the intellectual, mystic, and accused heretic, who predicted the French Revolution a century before it happened, saw some of them, giant bones, thus suspended in one of the churches of Valence. In the late 1600s. Footnote. Footnote. From a history of the warfare of science with theology in Christendom by Andrew Dixon White, D. Appleton and Company, 1896. Now available as an ebook, this is a revealing history of the trends and arguments between scientists and theocrats over time. White was a professor at and president of Cornell University and wrote this work, and I quote, over a quarter of a century since I labored with Ezra Cornell in founding the university which bears his honored name, end quote. Note, Cornell University has one of three known copies of T. Apollyon Cheney's 1859 illustrated first book. Highlighting the eagerness of the faithful to find biblical proof in the earth, Andrew Dixon White, in his fine 1896 history of the recurring battle between church and science, a history of the warfare of science with theology and Christendom, writes, The most brilliant service rendered to the theological theory came from another quarter, for in 1726, Schauser, having discovered a large fossil lizard, exhibited it to the world as the human witness of the deluge. Discovery was hailed everywhere with joy, for it seemed to prove not only that human beings were drowned at the deluge, but that there were giants in those days. The frenetic yet uninformed use of big bones to affirm quotations from Genesis was not limited to Europe. Increase Mather, the cleric and writer whose sermons stirred the infamous witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts, became a de facto expert on large bones being unearthed in the early Americas. Though 20 innocent people died during the witch trials, and Mather is known to have been president only one trial, colonists of faith still flocked to his words, however inspired and or ignorant. Yes, ignorant. Bringing curious bones found throughout New England to gain his insight. He then shipped these bones to European clerics and churches to spread the, quote, proof, end quote, of the flood in the New World. Similarly, the notion of creationism uses faulty evidence while ignoring actual evidence and scientific proof, all to bolster its errant standing. While there is no accurate tally of the resurgence of creationism, The concept of the, quote, Great Awakening, end quote, is cyclical. Remarkably and regrettably, yet predictably, President George W. Bush invoked the Second Great Awakening during Abraham Lincoln's, as well as Tiepolian Cheney's, time. This both offers insight and forewarns of the earnestness of those of faith. Fellow evangelicals like the President, former President, thank you, and creationists, have regularly used genuine finds and revisionist history to endorse their aims, however misguided or self-serving. Gracefully, frenetic faith often leads to the ludicrous. 
Take the example of the Cardiff Giant, unearthed in 1869 outside Syracuse, New York. The petrified remains of a 10-foot man found by a farmer digging a well held the world in awe. Speculation raged, the church and science at odds, deep debate, people lining up to pay 50 cents to see the local Leviathan. Despite obvious chisel marks on the petrified remains, the fervor only escalated until, at last, the truth came out. Years earlier, a local atheist named George Hull had an argument with a Methodist reverend over whether the Bible should be taken literally. Hmm, imagine that. Leading Hull to hire stonecutters to create the giant, then planting it on a friend's field, that was the farmer who was digging the well, in Cardiff, New York, to make the find more valid. The Cardiff giant was all a hoax. Hull succeeded in proving the gullibility of the faithful, but even this didn't stop people from lining up, nor a group of businessmen from paying $37,500, a lot of money in the 1800s, to move the giant to Syracuse. P.T. Barnum tried to buy the Cardiff giant for his museum in New York City for $60,000, but was rebuffed. So he had his own giant made and was soon drawing even larger crowds to view his hoax of a hoax. The original Cardiff giant may be the greatest fraud of all time when it comes to giants, but it still draws crowds and remains on permanent display at the Farmer's Museum in Cooperstown, New York. Interestingly, Cattaraugus County's carved wooden giants, those by Charles Huntington based on Tiapoli and Cheney's measurements, were also displayed at the earlier incarnation of the same museum in Cooperstown for a brief time. In addition to the ridiculous, whether the Cardiff Giant or that the Masons are trying to control ancient technologies and knowledge, scholarly, seemingly thorough and undeniable studies are also often co-opted to bolster the faulty. The worst example may also be the most crucial, the most vigorous study on forts and mounds ever attempted. As follow-up to Squire and Davis's expeditions and the Smithsonian's publishing of the ancient mounds of the Mississippi Valley in 1848, another more thorough study was begun in 1882 with the hiring of Cyrus Thomas. For 12 years, Thomas would oversee the largest, most massive excavation and inventorying of all the forts and mounds east of the Rocky Mountains, a feat unrivaled in its urgency as Western expansion and agrarianism were destroying most of the remaining forts and mounds, and expanse, with dozens of teams documenting, Thomas would write multiple annual reports for the Bureau of Ethnology, culminating in a definitive 730-page volume, released in 1894. Thomas skipped Cattaraugus County in favor of Chautauqua and Erie counties, perhaps because the reason was already documented by Cheney and others, as well as contained multiple Seneca reservations. But the final product is still impressive, and expensive. The Smithsonian's underwriting and publishing of the results of the 12-year Thomas expedition seem to set the record straight. Predictably, it has only given fodder for enthusiasts of giants and antagonists of science. The technical limitations of the era, combined with Thomas's rather dismissive bordering on racist views on the capabilities of Native Americans, certainly didn't help. Obvious examples are ignoring growing evidence that Natives had been mining and making copper implements for centuries prior to the arrival of whites, and, most blatantly, Thomas downplaying the possible age of mounds based on trees growing on top of them. Inexplicably, Thomas wrote, it has been ascertained that the rings of trees are not a sure indication of age. Despite his own limitations, technical and imaginative, Thomas's work was remarkable, highly credible, proving and validating that early Americans did in fact build impressive forts, cultural centers, and effigies in the form of magnificent mounds. Without mentioning giants or Atlantis, Thomas gave full credit for the earthworks east of the Rockies to Native Americans. Strangely, his multi-volume work is now the basis for multiple conspiracy theories, with many trying to say that Thomas failed to see, or outright ignored, the truth. His and the Smithsonian's credibility is constantly being questioned. 
the great interloper of ancient burial grounds, the 19th century Smithsonian Institute. 